Welcome to the second episode on the Soil Doctor Tool, where I dive deep into the principles of organic phosphorus. Phosphorus, unlike many other macronutrients, is fairly insoluble. It forms various insoluble bonds and organic complexes and is only solubilized for plant uptake in really small quantities. In living organic soil, I rarely see soluble phosphorus levels over four parts per million, and more often they're closer to about 0.5 ppm. When I do see it over four ppm, I can assume growers are using phosphoric acid for acidification of their water. In comparison with these levels, most salt-based systems push much, much higher levels of soluble phosphorus anywhere from 20 to 60 ppm, and sometimes higher. Managing phosphorus in living soils is completely different than managing it in a synthetic system. You simply build the total phosphorus levels in your soil to a sufficient level, and you usually use primarily carbon-based sources of phosphorus like bone meals and composts, and sometimes non-organic sources like soft rock phosphate, and then you let the microbiology cycle that phosphorus to the plant. There is a significant body of research that shows how high soluble phosphorus decreases microbial mineralization of phosphorus. So for example, high soluble phosphorus actually decreases mycorrhizal colonization. And this makes sense ecologically because uh, a major function of mycorrhizae is to solubilize phosphorus in the environment. But if there's enough in the environment already, the plant-fungal relationship is weakened. So therefore, if you want to build a microbially rich soil, building unavailable but slowly releasing sources of phosphorus should be the goal, not flooding the soil with soluble phosphorus. There are two times I would consider applying an organic liquid phosphorus. And the first is if you are getting a tissue test and the phosphorus is below the target level, I would apply phosphorus. And the second is if you have cold, wet soils outside and the plants are struggling with phosphorus uptake, I would apply a liquid phosphorus. Otherwise, stick to organic dry amendments. So here's how. The Soil Doctor tool looks at levels of phosphorus on both the standard soil test and the saturated paste test. And it determines whether or not to apply bone meal and soft rock phosphate. These are the best two targeted amendments to build phosphorus levels in your soil. You can choose to replace bone meal with fish bone meal for slightly more micronutrients and nitrogen, but I believe bone meal gives you more phosphorus for much less sodium and chloride. It's actually a fairly clean amendment that is primarily calcium and phosphorus. Here's how the Soil Doctor tool looks at phosphorus. If phosphorus on the standard soil test is above 1,500 pounds per acre of phosphate, P205, you don't need any more. After seeing hundreds of soil tests with corresponding tissue tests, I have found that 1,500 pounds per acre of phosphate in cannabis plants creates sufficient phosphorus levels at week two of flower, 100% of the time. Assuming that pH is in a healthy range, this provides a large enough reservoir of phosphorus for microbes to cycle that phosphorus into availability for the plant, and phosphorus will not be limiting yield. Therefore, the goal is to slowly build your levels of phosphorus up to that target number on the standard test. I do not recommend trying to hit that number with a single application. Just keep applying small quantities of both bone meal and soft rock phosphate round after round until you hit that number. So why build it slowly? As I mentioned previously, the scientific literature really indicates that high soluble phosphorus reduces populations of uh, beneficial microbes that would solubilize phosphorus, such as mycorrhizae. And a large application will create a flush of soluble phosphorus in your soil system. So 1500 is not excessive, but it's definitely high and it requires phosphorus inputs to get to that level. While theoretically high phosphorus can antagonize or reduce the uptake of micronutrients, I rarely ever see this happen. It's very crop specific, but in cannabis, I've never seen it organically. And researchers at North Carolina State University push soluble phosphorus up to several hundred ppm, obviously not organically, without any observed antagonisms, indicating to me that cannabis 
uh, in particular is very resistant to phosphorus antagonisms. So building high levels of organic phosphorus really isn't a problem as long as the phosphorus solubility isn't excessive. The Soil Doctor tool also looks at levels of soluble P on the PACE test. If levels are too high, it doesn't recommend any additional phosphorus, even if the total is below that target number of 1500. It also determines how much bone meal to apply based on the levels of available nitrogen in your soil because bone meal is 3% nitrogen. So if nitrogen is above the target level, the amount of bone meal recommended will be reduced significantly or eliminated entirely. Most of the time, uh, bone meal and soft rock phosphate are recommended at the same time in small quantities to build phosphorus levels. You may be wondering why the Soil Doctor tool doesn't use compost to build phosphorus. The short answer to this is because of the variability of phosphorus levels in compost along with the, the slow release rate of phosphorus. All compost will contribute phosphorus in varying quantities from a negligible amount to a large quantity. However, based on the compost feedstock and the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the product, the amount of phosphorus released is extremely variable and almost always fairly slow. So any increases in phosphorus from compost applications will simply show up on the next soil test that you take and be accounted for at that point in time. The attempt to calculate phosphorus release from compost is simply too crude for precision management of nutrition, in my opinion. And it's usually fairly small anyway. Many growers also use PSBs or phosphorus solubilizing bacteria in their operation. These organisms don't import more phosphorus into the system. They simply cycle it more efficiently to the plant. I'm a proponent of using these, but it doesn't change my recommendation to build the phosphorus levels in the soil to a sufficient place first. So I haven't seen PSBs increase the amount of soluble phosphorus in the soil solution, and that's just probably because their effect isn't as pronounced as a fertilizer application. My suggestion with PSBs is to always split test them in your operation to justify their cost and see if you can observe or measure a yield difference. So hit the link below to get a soil test and check out the Soil Doctor tool to see what kind of phosphorus application it's calling for in your soil.